your weapon, citizen. Step away from the Consul. It pains me to say this, but you'll have to come with us. Do as the Praetor says. There's not much I can do at this point. Why did you do this? Everything we've ever done. Was it all for nothing in the end? It's a selfless act, Kaiser. The final sacrifice of the finest commander Rome has ever known. If you think that, you are maybe not as smart as you seem. Let's go. You look miserable. You don't smell like you've had a bath in a while. I had a chat with Kato. He says not even Kikoro can save you. Why did you do it? We were ready to die for you. Thank you. I see no reason why we have to leave you in there. You may be waiting to be exiled, but they will never let you live. You're too dangerous. So, do you want to get out of here? That is for us to decide. Enough, Kaizel. She made her decision, and we must respect it. Wally, my friend. I will never forget you. You did well. You did very well. Thank you. Thank you. For showing me the very best of Rome. The spirits will remember you. The winds will sing your name in their songs. This is not the end. The sacrifice of the savior of Rome has long since passed into legend. The historian's task is often to distill true events from the myths that are shared among people. But in this case, it proves nearly impossible to do so. It is said that the execution of Rome's savior led to 12 days of sorrow among its people. Her corpse was taken from the temple by a mob stricken mad with grief and burned in the forum on a pyre built from the stolen furniture of every building on the Capitolium. Senators, eager to curry populist favor, declared her day of death to be a public holiday. Many built shrines of worship and reverence to their sacrificed heroine. Whether these accounts are untrue or perhaps exaggerated, one thing is beyond doubt. Though she had given her life to do so, she had saved the Republic from the brink of tyranny and the temptation of empire. It is thanks to her noble sacrifice that our democracy has only grown stronger and that our Republic endures to this day. Cineros. Once he had been an athlete, a wrestler, and a troublemaker. But in our story, he was a servus, a protector, and a mentor. He had died diligently performing the task to which he had devoted himself protecting his ward. Cineros was given a tomb in Rome's finest cemetery, next to his old Dominus, whose death had incited this story. Though his death had been unexpected, he met his end with dignity and resolve. He had received forgiveness and, after a fashion, vindication for the mistakes of his youth. He was missed by all those who knew him. Caeso left Rome with Lucia and their daughter, they traveled to Africa as Caeso remembered the warm nights and the lush Nile Delta fondly. Here they found a place to settle and made a peaceful home for their family. Though their relationship was distant at first, their devotion to their child drew them together, and their affection for each other grew stronger through the years. To his surprise, Caeso took well to fatherhood, and soon he and Lucia had many more children. Despite her disillusionment with Rome and everything it stood for, Calida was at least finally vindicated in the eyes of the law. Around that same time, her mother passed away, and Calida reconciled with her brother Aulus, whom she forgave for not standing up to their parents. Thanks to Calida's talent for spycraft, she deftly maneuvered the turmoil that swept across Rome in the wake of her friend's execution. And with her help, her family business thrived. After the death of his friend, Bestia returned to the arena once more. But he was no longer a gladiator. His new vocation was to teach Pankration, inspired by the example of his Magister Cineros. He applied himself to this new calling with every bit of the vigor and determination that had made him a champion before. 
As soon as things had quieted down, Bestia traveled to Africa once more to look for his sister. He did find her and bring her home, and she lived happily there for the rest of her life. With nothing left to keep her in Rome, Deanera returned to her homelands in Shervia, where she reconnected with her family. Far from condemning her for her sister's death as she had feared, they were all overjoyed to have at least one of their daughters back. In time, Deanera built a new family in Shervia and became a revered matriarch of her tribe. She never left them again. Claudiana lived for many more years. She had many friends in Rome, and her life was peaceful and comfortable until her final days. On her deathbed, she revealed that she had once been very close indeed with Lucullus, and that indeed the true family name of her children was Licinia. Cato soon retired from the Senate. The execution of his wife seemed to have left a bad taste in his mouth. His unshakable faith in the virtues of the Republic had, in the end, been shaken by her actions as well as the way she was punished. He retired to a farm outside Rome, and though he stayed in touch with his friend Cicero, he resisted all efforts to pull him back into politics. Cicero served one more year as consul before his retirement. In his old days, he lived a quiet life on a farm in Sicily, where he was greatly beloved by the people for his time as quaestor. He continued to write many books on politics and law. Defeated once more by Rome, Mithridates escaped to the lands north of the Black Sea in the hope that he could raise a new army. But the locals soon rebelled against his rule. Incapable of taking his own life by poison, in the end, Mithridates died by the sword of his bodyguard. With Zenobia in charge of Musia, it became once more a peaceful part of the Roman province of Asia Minor. With her focus on trade and strong ties to the neighboring regions, her people enjoyed a period of great prosperity. Without the leadership of Damianos, the rebellion of his gladiators soon spiraled out of control, beginning what became known as the Servile War. Escaped slaves terrorized the Roman citizens throughout Thracia until the wealthy senator Crassus brutally defeated them and crucified thousands along the road towards Rome. Lunia's death sent Nazamanes spiraling into a fractious conflict as greedy elders from minor tribes attempted to fill the void her passing had left behind. Though Queen Cleopatra attempted to bring the region under control, her attentions were too divided, the conflict too great for her to manage. Rome was forced to send more legions to enforce peace and stability with an iron fist. Though Africa Proconsularis eventually saw peace again, the traditions and culture of the Berber population were lost forever. Queen Cleopatra Philopator was, from the day of her coronation, a greatly beloved queen of Egypt. Revered and admired by the population, she spent many of her days traveling up and down the Nile to visit her subjects and address their troubles and concerns. Under her rule, Egypt remained a powerful and prosperous nation and a strong ally of Rome. The fruits of the Nile flowed freely to the people of the Republic. After traveling all across Africa for many years, going wherever her instincts took her, Raya eventually returned to Memphis and to the service of Tener at the Temple of Ubasti. When her mentor passed away, Raya naturally assumed the mantle as High Priestess of the Cat Goddess. Though the old faith was dwindling, she was greatly beloved by many, and her temple prospered, always home to many, many, many cats. With Diwitiacus once more assuming rulership of the Idwi, the tribe maintained a strong alliance with Rome, and through it, they greatly prospered. With the aid of the Idwi, Gallia slowly unified under Roman rule, and civilization soon began to creep into those lands in the form of paved roads, aqueducts, and fortified Roman towns. In his old age, 
Did the druid ever regret hastening the absorption and suppression of his own faith and culture? We will never know. The once proud and strong Arwerni were greatly reduced by the defeat of Wakinga Torix, but his survival gave them hope. His will to make war upon Rome had been crushed, but he remained a strong figure of leadership among his people, even despite his failures. With his guidance, the tribes of Gallia remained unified and somewhat at peace, and vestiges of their culture and traditions survived their gradual subjugation under Rome. In this work, I have done my best to recount the history of this fascinating period, truthfully and accurately. As I have scoured the sources and spoken to many who claimed to have heard the story from someone who was there at the time, one thing that has stood out to me is the pivotal moments along the way where our story could have turned out very differently. If the savior of Rome had fled into exile, would the absence of such a shining example of duty and sacrifice have left the Senate door open for another aspiring despot to take the throne? Or, if Wattelius Lurko had not been struck down on that stage, would the death of an innocent hero of Rome have served as an equally strong example to the citizens and senators? Most intriguingly of all, if the Legion had crossed the Rubicon on that fateful day, might Rome now be no longer a republic, but an empire? One should always take care when second-guessing historical figures with the benefit of hindsight. Here in the present, there will never truly be a way for you to know how you might have acted if you had lived in the past. Nor can you ever be certain how history will remember you.